Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> good morning. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> well, y'all stand up with me. We want to dedicate this time to the Lord. And I'm glad that you're here. If you're online, thanks for being here. Hit the, the share button or whatever, whatever you do on social media. I don't know. Um, everybody having a good week so far? It just started, so I hope, I hope it's good. <laughs> This is the first day of the week. We gather on the first day of the week to celebrate the risen Christ. And that's why we're here. Amen. So let's dedicate this time. Heavenly Father, we, we ask right now that you would invade this place, that you would fill this room with your glory. We invite you into our hearts and our minds. And church, just right where you're at, if there is anything that is hindering you from being in the presence of God today, if there's something you need to confess, something you need to pray about, some stress or worry you need to give to him, then do it right now. Just call upon his name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that your mercy is new every day. And so, Lord, in any, any sin... The scripture says, if we confess to you that you are faithful to forgive, and we get a brand new start, a brand new slate, we're so grateful for that. And Lord, all the worries, the stress, remind us this morning that you have taken responsibility for us as our Father. So all the worries, we can just lay in your hands and trust that you will be there. So in this moment, help us to pause and just be still in our mind and not worry, not stress, and all those things, we just lay them at your feet, trusting that you are the God who knows what we need, and you will provide. We give this time to you. Help us to worship you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. We are yours. We are yours. We praise you. We give you glory. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, God is bigger than you think. Amen.
were slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy of this is amazing grace This is amazing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life Then I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me God is good all the time. God is good. We're going to move into our hello time. This is a time to meet new people, see new faces. So I want you to turn, find somebody, introduce yourself, and tell them how God's been good to you this week. God is good all the time. When you, when you turn and you're telling people what God's done for you, that is a form of a testimony. The Bible tells us that there is power in the testimony. As we encourage the souls around us, you don't know who you told what was going on this morning. They may have needed to hear what God had done in your life. Right? And maybe you're sitting in a spot where you're saying, I don't really know what God's done lately. I'm struggling. All right, but Jesus Christ talks about this peace that resides deep in our soul. We often describe it as a peace that transcends all understanding. A peace that sets your feet on a rock. That you don't move as the situations come, as life gets hard, as family is pulling away from one another, as, as work is getting tough. You stand strong. And that's the peace that our Savior has to offer us right now, in this moment. We don't have to wait for the day that we die. It's not even what Jesus calls us to. He calls us to an abundant life right now. And so this morning we sing this song that says, peace, bring it all to peace. Take that to his feet. You just want that peace. You want your feet on that rock. That when the waves come, you're steady, you're strong. All right, so let's sing this together this morning. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still. Call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every way.
be our prayer this morning. pray church lord thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning with a group of believers that we can all feed each other We're li we live in a world of darkness right now we, we thank you for the opportunity to come in and stand in your light and the other believers in light give us the courage and the the discernment to step out and bring that light into the darkness because we live in a world of lies and it's getting worse so we come here at the beginning of the week to hear your word your truth open our hearts to hear that word and let it shape us. Here we stand, our hearts are yours. Let your will be done, not ours. Soften our hearts to be shaped into, your, your, into what you want us to be, not us. We are broken people. Make us whole. And as Pastor Lee preaches, guide his message. We all have problems in life. We're all in different places. So as Pastor preaches, open our hearts to hear what we need to hear from you and make us more like you as we step out into the darkness to spread your light. In your name, amen. amen. There's a lot going on, so y'all go ahead and take a seat, turn your attention to the screen and, and get caught up. If you ever want to know what's going on during the week, because it's hard to remember this video, you download the Church Center app, four easy steps, and you can get plugged in. Good morning, Crossroads. There's a lot going on, so we're just gonna dive right into it. This Saturday, a few days from now, in the gym building at 9 a.m. is the men's prayer breakfast. In the foyer at 9 a.m. is the women's Bibles and brunch. It's good food, it is great fellowship, there is child care provided in the daycare, so bring your family as you dive into the scriptures, as you dive into one another, creating relationships with people chasing after Christ as we all grow closer in the Lord. It's a great time. You don't want to miss it. If you're a woman for the Women's Bibles and Brunch, please sign up. Also coming up, April 19th, is Church Under the Bridge. If you are not familiar with that, that is the homeless uh, mission that we partner with once every other month to love on the homeless community of San Antonio. So please sign up for that. We need a lot of volunteers for that month. And so we need you to sign up for that as soon as possible. As Nacho Libre would say, it is the Easter times. And it's coming right around the corner. And so you have those invite cards and you have prayer cards. If you don't have them, they're at the front door. You can ask one of the greeters. They can get those for you. You need to be praying over those individuals. We believe in the power of prayer. See, it's not our responsibility to do the convincing or to do the convicting. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. All we need to do is come to the Lord in prayer over these individuals and then have the courage to invite them. And just let the Holy Spirit and God do the rest. And so 
We want you doing that. Be praying and then go out and invite. It's right around the corner, only a few weeks from now. So we'll see you on Easter's. On April 16th, we are having our Easter egg hunt and that is the Saturday before Easter Sunday. So make sure that you invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, everybody that you know because we're gonna have 15,000 eggs and we are also gonna have food trucks and it's gonna be a great time. Make sure that they register on the app. With that being said, we do need volunteers for our Easter egg hunt. If you would like to volunteer, please make sure that you stay after the second service on April 10th. So not this Sunday, but next Sunday. The live movie night was rescheduled to tomorrow night. Please bring your lawn chairs and your blankets because we will be outside. If you'd like to come, you just need to be 18 to 28 years old. Make sure that you invite your friends. It's gonna be a great time. We appreciate all of your tithes and offerings. We know that it makes a big con contribution to the church. If you would like to give today, you can give in the offering boxes as you exit and enter the sanctuary. You can give online or you can give on the app. Thank you, Crossroads. Hey Crossroads family, it's Pastor Thomas here. Just wanted to tell you that I miss you guys and I love you guys and I pray for you daily that you would have a life of abundance and a life to the full as you continue to grow and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to tell you we are in Albuquerque and we are moving forward. I know that video was kind of depressing and sad, but that's kind of what we're dealing with here in Albuquerque. We're dealing with a lot of crime, dealing with a lot of prostitution, dealing with a lot of drugs but it is okay because the Lord is doing an amazing work here in Albuquerque. We have our first Easter egg hunt where we're gonna have over 3,000 Easter eggs coming up. We have an outreach event where we're going to serve the homeless at Joy Junction, which is a homeless shelter here. And so I just wanna let you know that we are moving forward in Albuquerque with Crossroads Albuquerque. Things are going well. We definitely need your prayers. If you would continue to pray for us, that we would have vision, direction, peace, guidance, and protection as we continue to move forward and advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ here on earth as it is in heaven. Again, I love you, Crossroads, and I hope to see you guys soon. Raise a hallelujah! Amen. Amen. <clears throat> That's awesome. Awesome. I think Pastor Thomas cut his beard down. I don't know what happened there. It's a little strange. Uh, I do want to encourage you to be praying for Albuquerque. As we're getting started, we're still meeting in a house there. And uh, you saw the, the, the neighborhood. And so where the, the church is is not exactly in that neighborhood. We're trying to build a core group to be able to go into that neighborhood. <clears throat> uh, one of the people that you saw in the videos, a, a young man was in a black shirt, and um, he came out of the war zone. The war zone is is that section of Albuquerque that is uh, so dire, and and he he's been sober now for about six months. Got sober just just before we went down there, and it's in his house and his wife's house. His wife has been very faithful as a believer, uh, being patient with him. And, uh, but he now has a call into ministry and has entered into the course of study. And so we're excited about what God is doing in his life and their life. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Very good. So he, he's on Zoom every Tuesday night taking uh, coursework and uh, preparing for ministry. And uh, if you haven't noticed, maybe you notice we've had a lot of different people up here praying. And, uh, and these are all folks that feel a call into ministry. And so God is really providing and we are seeing harvesters. The Bible says the harvest is ripe and to pray for harvesters. Amen. So it's good to see that. Amen. And uh, so I wanted to remind you, uh, if you may, hopefully this is up on your refrigerator and you've got names on there. Uh, there are people in your life who are going through a valley. They're going through some of that darkness that we talked about and they need some peace. They need God. And so I've asked you to be praying about people and hopefully you have this on your refrigerator or somewhere that you see it on a regular basis. But I want you to be praying for them um, as we approach Easter. This is a time when, when people are more uh, open to coming to church, more open to talking about God. And so uh, hopefully you've been praying for those folks. But we're going to pray right now for them. And I want you to pray for Albuquerque and pray for our campus in Uvalde as we're all pre preparing for this uh, Easter season. All right, let's, let's pray. And just as we move into his presence in prayer, I want you to think about those people in your life. You know what they're going through. You know what they're up against. Some of these people, you've seen them their whole life wrestling with their flesh, never seeming to get out of the negative cycles. And just imagine yourself helping them find Jesus. Lord, we lift up every person that you have laid on our hearts here in Albuquerque, in Uvalde. Lord, each one of these people are precious to you and are precious to us. And so, Lord, we pray for them, believing that prayer is powerful and effective. And we trust that as we pray for them, your spirit will go out to them. To give them strength, to comfort them, to give them wisdom, or to give them a, a, a holy discontent that they would want to see change in their life. Lord, we pray that you would embolden us to be able to talk to them about God, to be able to share our testimony, to pray with them. Give us a boldness to invite them to church if they don't have a church home. Lord, not so that we can fill the building as much as that everybody needs support. And you have called us to be that support. We pray for Albuquerque and their their outreach event and what they're going to be doing. And we pray for Uvalde and their outreach. And Lord, be with us here as we go into our neighborhood and, and invite people to church and pray with people on their very doorstep. We pray that everybody that comes on campus for the Easter egg hunt, Lord, that would sense that the presence of God is here. Lord, we pray that you would begin to do all that you want to do in every soul. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. And everybody said together. Amen. Amen. Let's just give the Lord a praise offering for what he's going to do. I believe God is going to do some awesome stuff. Amen. Now listen, I was telling everybody in the first service, I've got 47 notes, 47 pages of notes today. The length of the sermon will de be determined by how many amens I get from y'all. <clears throat> We're done. We're out of no. <clears throat> so I need you to, to, to stay awake a little bit, give me some amen, give me some feedback, and we'll be done in no more than two and a half hours. Amen? Praise the Lord. I want to get right into it. I've been teaching about generosity. Everybody say generosity. If you don't know, that's what I've been teaching about. I hadn't done a good job, so I'm going to try to make up for it today. Generosity, having a generous spirit. We're not just talking about money, but having a generous giving heart, being willing to, to give yourself away when the Lord asks you to do so. Amen? And so I'm going to give you a few different scriptures here. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14. This is King David speaking. He says, but who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Amen? 
So first thing I want you to know before we get too deep is everything you got came from God. Everything you got came from God. Amen. Whether you like it or not, you may have a car out there that won't ever start, but thank God you're not walking. Right. Thank God you got somewhere to go. You, you may not like the people you're around, but you got a friend somewhere. Amen. If you don't call me, I'll be your friend. All right. And so everything you got, whether it's a clothes on your back and you may think, well, I go to work and I earn money and I take my paycheck and I buy my clothes. I buy who gave you the ability to get up in the morning. It was the Lord who put breath in your lungs. Amen. And he helps you get up. He helps you get a smile on your face. Some of you don't take that. Okay. But he is helping everything. We, there is nothing. You came into the world with nothing. You're going to leave the world with nothing. You ain't got nothing without God. Amen. And I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about every human being. The Bible says every, every, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father in heaven. Amen. So that's the first thing. Everything you got came from God. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, verse 35. The Apostle Paul says, Who has ever given to God so that God should repay them? There's nothing that you can do that would ever repay the kindness of God. Amen? We're going to be here a long time unless y'all give me some amens. I'm just telling you, we're going to, I'm going to go slow. You, you cannot give back enough to God for all that he has done for you. Amen? He, he's been too kind, too generous. He has given and given and given, even when we didn't even ask for it, when we didn't even know. If everything I got came from God, I got a lot of stuff. I got a lot of things. I wake up happy. I wake up and have it. Not that every day is great, but any good thing that I have came from God. Amen. And I can't give back enough to repay him. It says in, in, in Romans for from him and through him and for him are all things. Amen. To him be the glory forever. Amen. God owes us nothing. Now, these two things, if we forget that everything we have is from God and that I can never give back enough to repay the kindness of God, if I forget that, I'm going to fall into a trap. And that trap is becoming arrogant. Because if I can't remember that everything I have came from God, I'm going to start to think, hmm, maybe I got it myself. Maybe I earned it. Maybe I worked hard to do it. Maybe I got up in the morning and I fixed my own breakfast and I went to work and I made a lot of money and I did this and I, and I started thinking, hmm, I'm pretty good. Pride. Or even if you don't do it well, but you get in your mind that you, if you forget that God has been this kind to you, then even if you don't do well, let's say you messed up your life. Do I have any amens on that? Anybody else mess up their life? And, but what we do is we put the pressure on ourselves because if God's not taking care of me, then I got to do it. Now I got pressure. Now I'm not always going to do it well. Now I'm going to mess up. Now I'm going to mess up my life, mess up my kid's life, mess up my grand. I'm going to do all this kind of stuff. And there is pressure. Did you know that stress is a form of pride? Because it's me taking the responsibility for me as if I'm God. If, if, if you don't know, Jesus said that he is our father, he is our provider, he will take care of all of us. He says that the birds in the air don't have to go out and figure out how to eat, then he will take care of you. Amen? And, and so all we have to do is just give it to God. But when I stress, it is me forgetting how good God is. And when you forget this, then you get into this pride state. When you get into pride then you can still say the right things, but you don't live it out. So you can come to church and say, God has been so good to me, but then when you leave, you're so full of stress because you don't trust he'll keep being good to you. You can praise God for all that he does, but in the end, you're giving him thanks with your lips, but your life doesn't show it. And you can fall into this trap. Well, you know, God has been kind and everything I got is from God. But then the way you live is if everything depends on you and nothing on him. You with me? And so I want to talk to you today. How, how do you stay out of this trap of becoming prideful because you forgot how good God is? 
Well, Pastor, I would never forget. That's why I'm here, because I think, I, yeah, I know, I know what we say. But what we say and what we do aren't always the same thing. Amen? We, we, we tell our spouse we love them, and then we don't always treat them real good. Amen? Oh, that got close, because it was real quiet. Y'all hear that? It was real. We'll do a marriage enrichment another day. All right, we'll do that. So I want to get into this, and I want to uh, talk about how, to, how do we protect ourselves from this. So I got a lot of scriptures. We're on page 2 now out of 47. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Everybody say firstborn. I want to talk to you about the principle of the firstborn. And so Christ is the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn. There we have it again, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Everybody say firstborn. Now, Jesus now is the firstborn. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Colossae, and he's saying he is the firstborn. But Jesus was, was from the beginning, he is uncreated. He was born in the flesh to Mary, but he existed a long time before that. There is no beginning point of when Jesus was because he has always been. Amen? He has no beginning. He has no end. He'll be my beginning. He'll be my end. But he has no, he lives outside of time and space where he is eternal. So when the apostle Paul says that he is the firstborn, he is, he has drawn our attention back to something in the Old Testament about the firstborn children uh, of a family. And so I want to talk about that. He kind of talks about it a little bit. He says that the firstborn might have the supremacy, everybody's supremacy. So the firstborn is a symbol of everything in its highest form. Jesus is the firstborn. He is the highest standard. He is the highest form. He is the most excellent. He is the highest of high and the best of the best. He is the high standard. He is God. He is everything, and everything else is beneath it. Amen? And so when, when we start talking about the firstborn today, I want you to first think of the most excellent, the best, the very, very best. Amen? Now, also in the Old Testament, if you were the firstborn, you got a double portion of the inheritance. And so they would divide the inheritance, but you got twice as much as anybody else. That sounds pretty good if you're the, the firstborn. And, and so, but what that meant then is that you were financially responsible for the rest of the family. If somebody got in trouble, they'd come to you, and you would be responsible for getting them out of trouble. And so the firstborn has the responsibility of taking care of all the earthly needs of the family. The firstborn was also the priest of the family. Everybody say priest. And so now he is responsible for being the intermediary between man and God. It is his job to make sure the whole family comes to God, knows God, and stays with God. And so the firstborn is the earthly responsible party and the spiritual responsible party. And so because of that, he's been filled with all power. He is the ultimate. He is the extreme. He is the best. He is the highest form of God's kindness. Amen? This is who Jesus is. And I want you to understand that. Now, I want to dig into this and what it means. And so we're going to go back in Exodus. Turn to, with me to Exodus chapter 1. Amen? Oh, I'm going to go slow. Go slow. Exodus chapter 1. Now, in Exodus, we have the account of where Moses is being sent to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to bring the Israelites out of slavery. They've been enslaved for 400 years. And so that's the context in which we read right here in Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. He says, these are the names of the sons of Israel. Everybody say Israel. Now remember, Israel was a man by the name of Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And then Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Those 12 sons become the nation of Israel. 
And so it says, these are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Reuben Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, and Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. So what he's teaching us here is the genealogy of Israel. So Israel begins with Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Jacob's sons will become the nation of Israel and Jacob's name will be changed to Israel. So Joseph is already in Egypt. And so imagine Egypt is the womb in which Israel is born. The nation of Israel is born inside of Egypt. Israel first gets to Egypt through the seed of Joseph. Now, if you remember the story of Joseph, he was the one that had the coat of many colors. And all of his brothers hated him. And they beat him. And they sold him into slavery. And he ends up in Egypt. And when he goes down to Egypt, he gets put in prison. And, and some of the other prisoners start having dreams. And Joseph is given the ability to interpret dreams. And then suddenly Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, begins to have dreams and nobody can interpret them for him. And people remember Joseph in prison and so they bring Joseph out of prison. He's able to interpret the dreams. Now when he does, he's able to tell Pharaoh, here's what your dreams mean. You're going to have seven years of extreme wealth. You are going to produce so much as a nation, you're going to get filthy, stinking rich. But those seven years are going to be followed by seven years of famine. And if you don't prepare and if you don't save up, those seven years will destroy you. And so Pharaoh was so impressed. He says, God has given you this wisdom. And he said, because God has given you this wisdom, I'm going to put you in charge. And then you're going to take care of everything. So all the money that comes in, you're going to store it up and put it there. So then later when people need money, you can give it out to them as they need. And so Joseph, the seed of Israel, saves Egypt. Y'all with me? I'm only on page two. Now, Egypt would have died if it hadn't been for Israel. So God gives Israel to Egypt, and Egypt is saved. Now, let's keep reading. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Exodus chapter four now. Now, this is God telling Moses what to do. Verse 21, it says, the Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. Everybody say firstborn. So here you have it again. This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my son go. So he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Now, what happened leading up to this is, if we go back in the scripture, it says that time had passed, and now there's a new king in Egypt who knows nothing about Joseph. It says, whom Joseph meant nothing to. So you have a king who centuries before the king of Egypt recognized God has rescued us because he has sent us this man who is able to help us. And so they had Israel before they knew who Israel was. But now time has passed and this king has forgotten about Israel. He's forgotten about the kindness of God. And he's become prideful. And he begins to think, look how great I am. Who are you to tell me that you're going to go and do that? You're my slaves. I tell you what to do. You don't tell me what to do. He also thought, I've got all these millions of slaves, and if I let them go, what's going to happen to Egypt? Because i got the pressure of making sure everything's okay. And, and so here you have the, this moment where, where God is saying to, to Pharaoh, this is my firstborn son, and because you won't let him go, I'm taking yours. Do you see the firstborn? God said, you don't give me mine, I'm going to take yours. Amen? Are y'all still with me? Okay. Now, I want you to think about this before I go into the next scripture. Egypt did not believe in God, the one true God. Egypt was worshiping cows, 
You ever been around a bunch of cows? How people can worship cows? I do not know. I do not know. I mean, they have all those stomachs. They're always chewing their cud, and they smell. You know, that's, that's, I grew up in Hereford. I know cows, right? Now, it's fun to, well, anyway, let me, let me, I'll get myself in trouble if I keep talking. But I want you to see, even though Egypt had done nothing to honor God, God sent Joseph. God sent Israel. God sent his firstborn. He said, I'm going to send you my highest standard of power. I'm going to send you somebody that has supernatural understanding of the dream world. I'm going to send you somebody that has the wisdom to manage all of this. I'm going to send you somebody who will save your nation. God gave Egypt his very best even when Egypt didn't know him. I I don't care who you are, no matter where you think you are in your relationship with God, you may sit here and say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe I'm in all that kind of stuff. God has been giving you your his very best from the time you were born. Even before you were born, God said, I'm going to send my son so that for all of generations, anyone who believes in him shall not perish. Amen. God has been given his best. God always gives his best. Oh, we don't always see it, but he's always given his best. He always gives his firstborn. Are y'all with me? All right, let's go to the next scripture now. Verse in chapter 12. Now, this is when it all comes down. Exodus 12, verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. Now, you remember the story. I don't have time to go through the story. Moses kept going to Pharaoh. Pharaoh kept saying no. And then you had all the plagues. The water turned to blood. You had the gnats, the flies, the frogs, all that kind of stuff. Until finally, the last plague was that the angel of death would pass over and the firstborn son of every Egyptian home would be killed. Now, God had told Israel, you take a lamb and you slaughter the lamb And you put the blood on the top of your doorpost and on the side of your doorpost. And when the angel of death sees the blood, it'll pass over you. Amen? Amen. And so at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt. For there was not a house without someone dead. But all the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. And the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. And so I want you to see he is tying this together. What God is saying to Pharaoh, because you won't give me my firstborn, I'm going to take your firstborn from you. Because you did not give me what I gave you. I gave you power. I gave you wisdom. I gave you deliverance. I saved your entire nation. Now I'm asking you to give back what I gave to you. And you refuse. So I'm going to take even what I gave you. And I'm going to take your power. And I'm going to take your strength. And I'm going to take your wisdom. To Israel, he said, sacrifice a lamb. Put the blood on your door. When the door passes over, when the angel sees the blood, he'll pass over. But then he said, go to all your Egyptian friends friends and ask them for their money and they said okay now if you're an Egyptian and every time Moses and Pharaoh speak water turns to blood or there's a bunch of frogs in your bed or there's gnats flying through your ears or 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 all of a sudden everything's dark you know trying to light a candle and you just keep like those little trick birthday candles you know you can't even get any light there was a plague of darkness and so by the time it came to this they were like whatever you want just leave please so israel came out filthy rich they came out with their freedom If you remember, they came out and they came up to the water and and God had Moses raise his staff. And when he did, it says that the water stopped running down and there was a wall of water as high as 75 feet tall. And the Israelites walked across on dry ground into freedom. And God says, I'm going to take you out of here, but I've got something even better than this. 
I'm going to lead you into the promised land that is flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to bless you and bless you and bless you and just keep on blessing you. Amen? And so you have Egypt. Egypt loses Pharaoh. Pharaoh dies in the water because after the Israelites go across, Pharaoh and all of his army are chasing, and God closes the water. The entire Egyptian army is wiped out. And so Israel is free. Israel is rich. Israel is enjoying the goodness of God. Egypt loses all of its power, all of its firstborn, all of its wealth, all of everything. What was the difference? God said to the Israelites, consecrate to me your firstborn. They said, okay, here's my firstborn. And God said, because you're willing to give me your firstborn, I'm going to let you do an exchange, and all you got to do is give me a lamb. But when you give me this lamb, it represents your firstborn because you were willing to give me your firstborn. And since you're willing to give me your firstborn, I'm going to give back to you that same. And so they were able to sacrifice this lamb. Then they got to eat the lamb. Anyone ever had roasted lamb? Put a little salt on it, a little barbecue salt. Mm. So physically, what they gave, they actually received back. More than that, when they gave their firstborn, symbolized by this lamb, God says, because you were willing to give me your firstborn, your very best, now I'm going to give you my very best, which is freedom. It is power. It is wealth. It is leaving Egypt. It is having a new place flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to bless you and bless you, and all nations will be blessed. He, he was confirming his covenant all because they were willing to give the firstborn. But to Pharaoh, he said, you won't give me my firstborn. So I'm taking yours. If you remember when Moses was first sent to, to Pharaoh, God says, tell Moses, I mean, tell Pharaoh, we want to go and worship for three days. Three days. Now, now, some people may say, well, God was just trying to play with Pharaoh a little bit. But the Bible says God can't lie. And so God was just trying to give Pharaoh a chance to give him his firstborn so he could give him back. He was trying to change a relationship between slave masters and slaves, trying to change how they interacted the two different nations so that it became a friendly place. And, and so he said, if you'll give me your first, my firstborn, Israel, then I'll give them back. And so when, when we look at this, all we see is he didn't do it, and so then God struck him, and he lost all of his power. Israel gave the firstborn, gave their best, and what God is trying to teach us is when you give your best... That I will give to you exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ever ask or imagine. Amen? He's saying, I will give to you and I will press it down. I will shove it down. Imagine the blessings of God and God opens your brain and just shoves more blessings in. Right? Just shove it in. And he says, you're going to shove it in and then it's going to come out. And it's going to be pouring out all over your kids, all over your grandkids, all over everybody. You become a blessing and everybody around you gets blessed because you gave your firstborn. Amen? But if you don't give your, first, your best gift, God gave you what you got. Nothing you have came from anywhere but him. And now he's saying, out of what I gave you, give me the best back. Now remember, the firstborn was the one responsible. And so if anything happened to the firstborn, it was said in the Old Testament, it destroyed the family. Now, there were times that God switched things around, but if the firstborn was responsible spiritually and physically, if something happened to the firstborn, it affected the entire family. And so the firstborn also represents the whole family. And so what God is saying is, I want you to give me everything, but I'm going to allow you to give me a portion that is your best and that will represent everything. And if you give me your best gift, I will see that as if you're giving me everything, giving me all of it, giving me the full portion, your very best gift, and then I'm just going to lavish my love all over you. Amen? All right, page three. First Corinthians 15, 20. We, we've already talked about Christ being the firstborn, but now Paul calls him something different. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, 
the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Everybody say first fruits. Now, the word first fruits and the word firstborn come from the same root word. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Now, he's telling us here that God is the firstborn he's given to you to take care of you spiritually. He says, I gave you my firstborn. I gave you my very best so that spiritually you could be okay. And so now I know that in Christ, I have a peace that surpasses all understanding. In Christ, I have a joy that is unspeakable. In Christ, I have a peace in the middle of the storm. In Christ, I have the wisdom to navigate the storm. In Christ, I have the ability to walk on top of the storm. In in Christ, I can do all things because he has given me his power. He has given me all of it. He has given me the highest form of all that he is. He says, this is my firstborn. He is yours. Amen? So now spiritually, I have to give my best gift. And so when I come in here to worship, if I just kind of halfway go through the motions, then I'm not giving my best gift. If I come in here and say, I don't know that song, so... I'm going to play games on my phone. If we come in here and say, how many, how many bluebell jokes can you tell in 30 minutes? I, I don't know. It's, if we get in here and all we think about are our problems, and we don't worship, we're not giving our best gift. See, we have to give our best gift when we worship. Give, give your best gift when you pray. Amen. Sometimes we wait to pray until we're in trouble. Don't, don't be quiet. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We, we, don't, we learn how to pray real hard when everything is bad, but we don't pray in the best of our moment, in the best of our energy. We give our best energy to work. We give our best energy to the traffic. We give our best energy to the stress. And God is saying, give me your best gift. And so when I am energized, that's when I should pray. When I'm energized, that's when I should worship. I should make sure that my physical body is ready so my spirit can give its very best. I should give my very best to my neighbor, whether they need help building a fence, whether they need their lawn mowed, whether they need prayer. I need to give my best gift. Amen? But then he says, but it's also the first fruits because it's not just the spiritual responsibility, but the earthly. He says, I gave you my firstborn to supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. So if I'm going to activate the principle of the firstborn, and if I want to receive the best that God has, I need to give my best back to him. Remembering that all I can give him is what he already gave me. Because nothing I have came from anywhere but him. Amen? When I think about Egypt and who they were, I think, man, God was so good to them so kind to them to give them his firstborn. And I look back on my own life and I think, how many times have my lips said one thing and my life said something different? But still, God paid my bills. God gave me a good wife. God gave me some awesome kids. Got a grandbaby on the way. Right? Finally, all this gray is going to make sense. I mean, God has been so good. Is there anybody else who would say, you know, I didn't always walk the walk that I was talking, but God just kept blessing and blessing and blessing. Amen. And my question to you this is, is this, if God was that generous with you before you gave your best, how much more, how much more will he do if we would just give him our best? Amen? How much more? Some people say, well, I can't afford it. 
The word first fruit means promise to come. When you give your best, whether it's your best time, your best energy, your best offering, what, whatever it is, to financial, earthly, spiritual, whatever it is, when you give your best, essentially what you're saying is, God, I'm remembering your promise is coming. And I have faith that you will do what you said. Amen? Stand up with me, and I just want to pray with you. We got to page four. That's pretty good. It's better than the first service. In God good. When I think of Jesus as the firstborn, and it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I remember the words of the prophet Isaiah who says, he was bruised for my iniquity. He was crushed. And by his stripes, I am healed. He gave me that before I ever even looked at him. I can never give him enough to repay what he's done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have been so kind. Lord, help us not to take advantage of your kindness. Help us not to live as if we're God and you're not. But instead, Lord, teach us how to give our very best to you. Not just to give you lip service, but to give you our best. Not just to be in a church service, but to be engaged in your spirit. Not to be a nominal Christian, but to be a sold out follower of Jesus as if we owe everything to you because we do. Church, as we sing this song, if you've not been giving your best to him, do it today. Make a decision today. From this point on, I'm going to give you the very best I have of my time, of my energy, of my money, of my relationships. I'm going to give you the best. Make a decision today. Praise your name.
the Lord this morning. As you walked in, you may have received one of these giving generosity ladder cards, and I just want to encourage you to take those, to look through it, see where you would fall um, in, in this ladder, and complete as much as you're comfortable completing. Um, you can also leave it up here on the altar um, after, after service. Pastor Lee will, will come by and pick them up, and he'll pray for them and pray for you throughout the week um, if you would like to fill this out. I'd also want to encourage you as you walk out to get some... Um, invite cards. Our next big day is Easter Sunday, a couple of weeks from today. We're excited about that, and we also know that people are more likely to visit churches with a personal invite and during the Easter season, right? So let's take this opportunity to take a few cards, invite your friends, your family members, your co-workers, so grab a few of these as you head out as well, right? I also just want to, you know, reiterate everything that Pastor Lee was saying, and I want to encourage you to live your life out as if God has blessed us because he has. Don't just say it with your words, but actually live it. Actually live it. Actually believe it. Believe it in every ounce of your being. Believe it, right? So if you are a first-time guest here, we are so glad and so thankful that you are here joining us today. We want to welcome you. We want to meet you. We also want to bless you with the free gift. If you want to meet us in the back in the Welcome Center, we have Alicia and Gina back there, and they're happy to meet with you. We have uh, one of Pastor Lee's books in that gift, too, that we want to bless you with, right? Right? So as you go on with your week, as you go into your workplace and you're with your family this week, please just try to live out our mission here at Crossroads, and that is to love people into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. You are dismissed. Be blessed and have a great week.